God, you have to make him suffer like that. You will address me by my proper title, Kirk. I'm sorry, I should have said Captain Garth. I am Lord Garth. Bridge to all decks. Time for a brand new episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Mance. I really am Scott Mance. And I am Lord Steve. Lord Steve. Well, Queen the Queen's level three, mister. <laughs> uh, you know, there are an infinite number of responses to that. Move. I'm looking for just one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone listening to Enterprise Incidents. Yes, we are covering the third season classic, if you can call it a classic. Whom Gods Destroy. Steve, what has been your take of Whom Gods Destroy over these years, and what has been your take during your rewatch? So I want to say one quick thing first, which is I know that basically almost every episode of Star Trek is probably somebody's favorite episode of Star Trek. And as we're into the, you know, the home stretch at the end of season three, I feel real bad, I, you know, because I don't want to tear up People, something that people love. That doesn't sound like a good thing. But the fact is, I never particularly liked this episode. And much like a few others recently, more scrutiny and paying attention to detail yeah, yeah. does not improve it. No, you know? I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I too feel bad, you know, having to, like, like occasionally if we came across a dog like, the alternative factor or, and the children shall lead, you know, we could like really lay into it knowing that, you know, we're in good company because a lot of, a lot of fans, maybe not everybody, but a lot of fans certainly feel the same way. But, you know, like when we did uh, that, which survives, I know that there were people who were like, Hey, wait a minute. I really like this episode. And, and that's, that's great. It's great. And, and the thing, I mean, the difference I think is that, Alternative Factor came right after City on the Edge of Forever. Right. So we went from just gushing about one of the greatest episodes of television ever to, <laughs> to a bad episode, and that's fine. But now where the bad episodes are starting to outnumber the good, yeah. it doesn't feel so, so and good. And there is this is definitely a big epiphany that we've had doing Enterprise Incidents in production order. The epiphany that when people... When people put down the third season saying it's not as good as seasons one and two, of course. It's true. It's not as good as seasons one or two. Absolutely true. But if you break it down, now, now obviously the way that the episodes aired were in a different order than the way they were filmed. And we cover Star Trek on Enterprise Incidents, the original series, by production order in the way that they were filmed. So the big epiphany for me, and I know for you as well, and hopefully for a lot of our, our enterprisers, our, our listeners, is that the first half of season three was really, really strong, except for Spock's brain, except for And the Children Shall Lead, up to and including Day of the Dove, season three, was really, really outstanding. It was starting with Plato's stepchildren moving forwards where the bad episodes outweighed the good ones. And now we are at an episode that I have not seen in many, many years. And there is a reason for that because while I was re-watching Whom Gods Destroy, I definitely felt, you know, not a great episode of Star Trek. No. Now, having said that, I still say that a not great episode of Star Trek still has its merits because I like these characters, I like these actors, and I would still rather watch a subpar episode of the original series over, just going to say it, any episode of Discovery. So there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. That's it. I'm not sure if that's true for me, but I'm not a big, huge fan of Discovery either. But, you know, at least, you know, we are in the home stretch of the original series. You know, we've got nine episodes to go, including this one, Whom Gods Destroy. Now, the title, Whom Gods Destroy, was taken from the poem, The Mask of Pandora, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1875. And the quote from that poem is actually, Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. The episode aired on January 3rd, 1969. It was the 69th episode to air, and this was the only network airing that Whom Gods Destroy had. It wasn't going to be seen again until syndication, but it was the 72nd episode to film. It was shot between October 14th and October 23rd, 1968, shot over seven days, so it went one day over schedule, and there is a reason why. It was also... About $1,400 over 
budget, the total cost for whom God's destroyed came in at $179,778. This is one of the episodes that was banned in the UK until the early 1990s, along with the empath and Plato's stepchildren for just being too violent and unsettling and disturbing, and if you two, can believe it. And two out of three of those, the UK lucked out. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, but uh, the episode was directed by Herb Wallerstein. It was his third episode after the second half of The Tholian Web and after That Which Survives. It was written, the story at least, was written by Jerry Saul, who wrote The Corbomite Maneuver. Uh, and it was the teleplay was actually written by Lee Irwin, uh, Saul contributed his story outline uh, in the middle of 1968. The date is unknown, but then Lee Irwin did his first story outline on July 18th, 1968, and he went all the way to a second revised draft teleplay on September 5th. Arthur Singer wrote his rewrite, his final draft, on October 7th, uh, and then Fred Freiberger did his page revisions between October 10th through October 17th, while the episode was in production. Would you like to know some of the things going on while they're filming this episode? Hopefully they are better than the episode itself. Some are. Some, some are definitely better. Um, it's funny, since Star Trek is doing a schedule where they split a day, the last day of the shoot was October 14th for That Which Survives. That's also the first day of this shoot. And I'm just going to say again, that's also the day I was born. Happy birthday to you, mister. <laughs> so it's still my birthday. It's still your when birthday. They're, when they begin making this uh, show on October 15th. I don't even remember. I think it was last week that uh, Jack Valenti introduced the new rating system for right. movies. Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's one director that was super excited about one of those ratings, and he made darn sure that his film, Vixen, got a, rated, a rating of X. And that man is Russ Meyer. Wow. Okay. So he was very happy to have that. On the same day, uh, Lyndon Johnson gave phone calls to all three of the major candidates, Hubert Humphrey, Nixon, and Wallace, to give them updates on what was going on in Vietnam, because basically one of you guys is going to inherit this, and A, news was not good, and B, he said we are going to continue our bombing in North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. On the same day, and this is also something we mentioned in the last episode, John Carlos and Tommy Smith rose their fists with black gloves and the black power salute after winning the 200 or, or getting gold and bronze in the 200 meter race in Mexico City. And obviously this is one of the most iconic images for sure uh, in sports history. Um, this one's really sad. On the same day, there's a very well-known mountain climber, Jim Madsen, and they're on El Capitan in Yosemite. And he has two buddies who are in distress on the mountain and he climbs to go rescue them and falls to his death. Oh, wow. Isn't that just, it's just That's a sad. terrible, terrible That's story. Mm -hmm. um, on October 17th, the film Bullet premiered. Great car chase. Very cool car chase. <laughs> on the same day, Jackie Kennedy announced that she was marrying one of the world's richest men, and that is... Aristotle Onassis. Exactly. Yep. Um, more news from the Olympics. Bob Beeman broke the world long jump record, and he built, broke it by so much that it la that record lasted for 23 years. And I, and I get, advise everyone, go on YouTube and watch this jump because it's, it's like he floats <laughs> you know, further. And what I didn't realize, which is on the very next day, Dick Fosbury introduced the Fosbury flop, also winning the uh, Olympic gold medal, also setting a world record that lasted for a long time. That's in the high jump. And we also, on October 18th, have some Beatles news. One Beatle in particular had a very rough day. Oh, wait, wait. October? 18th. 18th. I'm going to say that was John and Yoko. Uh, Yoko miscarried. Oh, no. you were. It is John and Yoko. No, they were arrested. Oh, they were arrested. For drug possession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you had the right couple, though. <laughs> yeah. And this, this one, we didn't know for 48 years. But on October 22nd, Richard Nixon who had just talked to Johnson about what was going on in Vietnam, called up who's going to be his future chief of staff, H.R. Halderman, who's a name we obviously oh, know sure. from Watergate, mm -hmm. and asked him to call up the South Vietnamese president and encourage him to not go to the peace talks. Because Nixon felt that the war in Vietnam was going to get him elected. He wanted the war to continue. If they found peace, that would have been better for Hubert Humphrey. Oh. Now, we don't know whether or not this affected anything. Uh -huh. But 
the peace talks did definitely fall apart and 30,000 more Americans died after this. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, again, like I said, did did that phone call change the course of the war or stop the peace talks? Mm, uh, we can't say that. Yeah, right. But it is, and it is 100% against the law for a private citizen to go negotiate behind our country's back. That is <laughs> yeah, definitely that's a big no-no. No. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, we, they launched last week, and now the crew of Apollo 7 all landed safely. They all had pretty serious colds, by yeah. the way. Mm-hmm. But the mission was a success. Yeah, they were. Uh, Wawa Shara, who was the uh, commander of Apollo Seven, you know, he was also one of the original Mercury yeah. Seven astronauts, and he also went up on Gemini. So he was at that point the only astronaut to do Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. And when you know NASA kept giving the crew of Apollo Seven tests to perform while they were orbiting the Earth, you know, Wawa Shara was really cranky. Because he had the cold, but also his his priority was to make sure that the command module was in perfect working order. And this was the mission that got the Apollo program back on track after right. the fire of January of 1967. It's funny. And, and a few years later on Apollo 13, uh, all I could say is Gary Sinise. Now I don't remember the, the actual astronaut's name had to stay home because he... Because he might have the measles. Because he <laughs> yeah. might have the uh-huh. measles. Yeah. Ken Mattingly. Ken Mattingly. Yep. Thank you. Good. Good. I always can depend on you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, shall we beam down to what's the name of the planet? Planet that they are orbiting at the beginning of Whom God's the Story is the planet Elba 2. It has a poisonous atmosphere. Is that Idris Elba 2? Uh, Idris Elba? Maybe? Is he is he our age? I think he's... Uh, <laughs> probably about probably, our age. Probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the, the name... The, for the planet Elba II derives its name from the island of Elba. Now, uh, I knew you were going to get this, Mister. Where Napoleon was yes! after? Uh... Oh my God! You are you are unbelievable. Well, <laughs> you are unbelievable. Listen, the Beatles is your area. <laughs> Weird ancient history. Everything facts. else is yours. No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, like I'm like writing this down. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm going to be so excited if he gets this. And yes, you got it. Napoleon was exiled to this island after uh, his forced abdication. Um, but yes, so so that's where the, the the name comes from. But there is a Federation asylum on Elba II. The few remaining incorrigibly insane people are are or aliens rather are on this uh, at, on this planet in this asylum where they are about to be tested with a new medicine. That will hopefully eliminate mental illness forever. Let's let's just look at that. That here's this episode. They're filming it in 1968, and here we are in the 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 21st century, where mental illness is very much a topic of conversation for for many many reasons. And here's this drug that will eliminate mental illness forever. I just think that's such a an idealistic aspirational quality of this episode that like you know we get to a point where we can get rid of mental illness forever i thought that was actually pretty cool sure i think that's a great idea i also (laughs) think it's like so we have a whole planet for 13 people 15 15 people that's a that's a seems like a let me be really really bad people but we're we're on it we're on sort of a a sort of a penal colony of sorts so what episode does this remind you of already like dagger of the mind dagger of the mind yeah dagger of the mind is a good episode yeah uh, this one, not so much. Right. But at least, you know, there are there are things that carry over that give give it consistency. Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially with the uniform that, that Dr. Donald Corey, the governor of this asylum, is played by Key Luke. So Key Luke uh, was on TV as Master Poe in Kung Fu. He was Zoltar on Battle of the Planets, and he was on MASH. Uh, he was also a very in-demand voiceover actor uh, with appearances in animated shows like Jabberjaw, Plastic Man, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, and Alvin and the Chipmunks. But on his film career, you're talking going back to the 30s, where he was number one son in the Charlie Chan movies. Wow. Yeah, way back. Uh, he was also in the Green, uh, the Green Hornet. He was Kato in the Green Hornet movie. In the movie serials, the probably? movie, yes. In the movie. And... Gremlins. Oh, he is in Gremlins. He's in Gremlins. That's yeah. what I thought. Like when I was going through his uh, bio, I went, 
he was the one who gave the family the Mogwai, and he showed up at the very end. Right. Remember? Yep. Uh, Hoyt Axton opens the door, and he's standing there, and he's like, give me my Mogwai back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think he's really good. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think the episode's good, but I think he's good. And it's interesting that, obviously, Kirk knows him. They're yeah. old friends from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And we also hear, like in Dagger of the Mind, there's a force field, and that there, you can't beam up or do anything with this force field in place. The rehabilitation program isn't progressing too well. And I have my doubts about the effectiveness of this medicine, too. Why, well, Donald, are you becoming a pessimist? <laughs> I'm afraid I have. So here's my first question. So, spoiler alert, mm. Donald is actually Garth. <gasps> oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is just going to be my note for the whole episode. Okay. Is that people should have reasons for what they're doing, even if they're crazy. They could be crazy reasons, Mm -hmm. but I don't understand why Garth is having Donald be pessimistic about the, the medicine. You know, he should be optimistic because that would lure Kirk more into a sense of security. You're right. I I agree with you. Uh, But nothing about Garth is rational. Nope. Or given much thought. And that's part of the the problem. the second that's more of the problem for me. Yes, yes. But that's part of the problem with why I don't buy him as a real threat in this episode. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is what we hear right now is that he's the latest inmate, that it's Garth of Izar. The former Starship Fleet captain. And Kirk has a very strong reaction to that. When I was a cadet at the Academy... His exploits were required reading. He was one of my heroes. Now, when was the last time we heard Kirk refer to another figure of authority in the Federation as someone he w- who instructed him or someone who helped him back when he was in the Academy, someone he idolized? I was uh, trying to think about it. There's definitely some, but they're not popping in my mind right now. The, the one that pops into my head as being the most recent before whom God's destroy is John Gill. From patterns oh, of force. right. Yes, that's a that's a good one. You know, there he's right on the bridge, and he says he was my instructor at the academy. Right, and you know, it's it's also it's been a while. I think in the in the second season, especially during the Gene Kuhn years, you know, we heard more about Kirk's past. Yeah, during at the academy. So this episode, Whom God's Destroy, it feels like it's the first one in a while where I went, oh, okay, they're bringing back some backstory into Kirk at the academy. Does Kirk know what Garth did and that he went crazy and tried to destroy this planet? Uh, I, I don't think he knows the extent of it until, until now. Because when he gets to the planet... He seems he, surprised that Garth is here. Exactly, exactly. He, he's, he's like, he should know that. He should. I mean, this is like a, his hero. Right. Who he was a fleet nuts, captain. A fleet captain yep. and tried to make a starship destroy a planet. Kirk should know about this. And also, also with regards to... To the to Garth, he's he's identified as a fleet captain. Mm-hmm. The last time we heard an, a figure of authority in the Federation referred to as a fleet captain was Pike. Mm. Captain Christopher Pike was referred to as a fleet captain in the beginning of the Menagerie. Gotcha. So uh, they are walking uh, into sort of the prison. They go through these force fields that get turned off and on, and we hear captain. You're making a mistake. And there in one of the cells is a green woman. A green woman who, even with that green makeup, should look really familiar to fans of Batman because Marta is played by Yvonne Craig. She was on Batman as Batgirl, and then she got her own short-lived series as Batgirl. It's probably what she's best known for. But she was also on TV shows like The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, 77 Sunset Strip, on film, she was in the, the original Gidget movie, and she was in two Elvis movies. It happened at the World's Fair and Kissing Cousins because she was uh, dating Elvis at the time. And uh, according to James Dewan, I did not know this, but according to James Dewan, Yvonne Craig was originally considered for the role, are you ready for this, of Vina in the cage. Wow. Well, when you look at the dance... That she yep. does later in the episode as a, a Green Orion slave girl, which was the, uh, right. the dream sequence, the illusion that Pike has that makes perfect sense. But it was it's also worth noting, it's also worth noting that Whom God's the Story and Yvonne Craig represents the third guest star from Batman 
as in as many episodes. Yeah. Because you had Lee Merriweather, Frank Gorshin, and now Yvonne Craig. That's that's kind of nuts. And I I feel like she was given the direction, act crazy. And that is what she's doing throughout the whole episode. That is exactly what she's doing. As opposed to like motivations and all the things that actors should normally have. And having like, you know, feeling empathy and sympathy for her, which I never No, not not once at any moment. And she is saying that she's in there, that she shouldn't be there, that she's rational. And Spock says, which I think is incredibly stupid for Spock to say. She sounds rational enough, Captain. Does she? (laughs) First of all. And second of all. Spock, come on. <laughs> like she's <laughs> yeah. in the, the the most incorrigibly criminally insane place in the world and you hear her talk for 10 seconds and you go, "Yeah, she seems rational." <laughs> it, it it does make the asylum in uh, Dagger of the Mind feel like Disneyland by comparison. Yeah. <laughs> um and then she is basically trying to convince them that they can't trust uh Governor Corey. Mm-hmm. And he says, "Laugh it off." Yep. <laughs> She's been saying that for days now. Our medical staff can't figure out why. And again, if Marta is on Team Garth, why is she creating suspicion around Corey? And the only reason you go is like, well, because she's crazy. Right. But that, it's just what you said before. That makes our bad guys less threatening because they don't, they're not doing anything that makes sense. Like if there was a motive for Marta to do this, that, uh, you know, beyond just the fact that, that, that she's crazy, like, you know, there, there's, there's no, and this is the problem. It, it just starts with Marta, but it carries over to Garth. Absolutely. I did not feel. Well, we'll, we'll get into. Yeah, that. yeah. We're continuing to walk down the hall. We see an Andorian. We see some other aliens, uh, which I don't know where they're from, but we've seen these kind of guys before. Uh, we have an Andorian. We have a Tolerite. Tolerite. That's so the is. Andorian and the Tolerite we saw in Journey of the Babel. Right. But as they're walking through and seeing them in their uh, cells. It kind of reminded me a little of the cage, yeah. When uh, Captain Pike is looking, in, is in his monsters. cage, and he sees all the other yeah. monsters. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Garth. He's been unusually disturbed, and we've had to impose additional restraint. Corey? <gasps> yes, Jim. I'm Corey. And then the fake Corey <laughs> starts to laugh maniacally. And the real Corey is like, he tricked you. And then there is a, an effect, and Corey, who is a short guy, turns into Garth, who is a tall guy. So that Garth is Steve Inat, uh, who was on TV shows like The Outer Limits, The Fugitive, The Virginian, and Mission Impossible. He was also on film in movies like Countdown, Madigan, Zigzag, and Fuzz. And I didn't realize this. Like, like, how come I never really saw this actor in other things after Star Trek? So this episode aired in 1969. And Steve Inett died of a heart attack at age 37 in 1972. Oh my God. Yeah, I was shocked. Well, that's young. Yeah. Uh, he was at the Cannes Film Festival promoting a movie called The Honkers when he died. Uh, but Garth is supposed to be 15 years older than Kirk. But uh, Steve Inat was actually three years younger than William Shatner, so they dyed his hair silver to make him look older. I think that's a huge mistake. I mean, I, 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 don't, I have no opinion on whether or not he's a good actor because the material he's given is so terrible. I agree. But, like, this guy should have been older. Yeah, you know? oh, I agree. He looks like Kirk's age, basically. Yeah, you know? sure. Mm-hmm. And then when he turns into Garth, all the cells open. Marta, who is wearing kind of like a house coat, throws it off and now reveals a more sexy outfit. The other bad guys show up, and Marta goes up, puts her arms around Garth. You said you wanted to see me, Captain. Well, here I am. (laughs) And that brings us to the end of the teaser. Now, this episode was loosely based, and I didn't know this when I, when I, all these years that I watched it, but it is apparently based on the Broadway play and the 1967 British film Marit Sad about the Marquis de Sad who directs a play about sadism using inmates from an insane asylum as actors. I know the play. um, And, uh, okay. (laughs) Did did you, did you? No, I never knew that. Know that? Never occurred to me. No, I see no connection to that play (laughs) other than that there's an insane asylum. Yeah, there's an insane asylum. It's a weird play, by the way. Uh, And earlier versions of the teleplay were apparently darker and more gruesome Uh, Fred Freiberger asked uh, Lee Irwin to tone it down. Uh, Also in earlier versions, 
there was no happy ending as Garth was not shown for having the potential to be cured. Hmm. Okay. Um, we come back in Act 1, and they are dragging Spock away, and we hear... Your Vulcan friend is still alive, Captain. My phaser was set to stun, not to kill. Now, let me ask you a question. Okay. Did you wonder, is there a scene missing here? Yes, that is literally, I wrote, why is this off camera? Is there something missing? Yes, there is. <laughs> because in the script, there was supposed to be a scene where Garth shoots Spock with his phaser on stun. But as they were trying to keep costs down... Even just that little phaser blast, you know, that that sound effect and the, the yeah. visual effect, that costs money. So the idea was, well, if we just have Spock being dragged away and then we hear from Garth that his phaser was set on stun, then we save some money there. So that's why it looks like there was a scene missing, because there is. This is so frequently having to save money is something you're always doing in films. Even even big, huge Hollywood films with millions of dollars are still trying to save money. Sure. And when you're faced with those problems, that's why you always laugh. But I'm always excited when I hear a smart way of being cheap. <laughs> this is a dumb way of being cheap. Yeah. It's like, well, if you're going to do that, then don't have it be a phaser. Mm -hmm. Hit Spock on the head. Do mm -hmm. something, you know, like coming up with an explanation of why you're not showing the thing. Right. Come up with something better to show. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and now Kirk, who is in the cell with uh, Donald, is trying to get Governor Corey freed. God, you have to make him suffer like that. You will address me by my proper title, Kirk. Now, for Kirk, the proper title is Captain, so that's what he says. I'm sorry, I should have said Captain Garth. I am Lord Garth. I am Lord Garth. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, this is the big problem I have with this episode, is... There is nothing about Garth that makes me feel like he really is a threat. Even with his phaser, even with this like all-powerful explosive that he apparently created on a penal colony planet, uh, with nothing, what I get is that now we have another starship captain or even fleet captain who's lost his mind. Yep. So we have Commodore Decker in Doomsday Machine. We have Captain Tracy yep. in, uh, in the, the Omega Glory. But I felt, I remember we had this conversation when we were doing the Omega Glory, I felt like Captain Tracy could actually kick Kirk's ass, and yeah. he does. Um, I felt like Captain Tracy was a real threat. I don't feel like Garth is a threat, and I don't think that the actor's performance it helps at all. And that's a problem. It's a huge problem. And, and I'll say, too, is that my guess is if we had met Commodore Decker before the Doomsday Machine, he was probably a really good Commodore. And everything he did was motivated by what had happened to him and by what his goals were. We, and this again, so the, I've mentioned this term many times, but show don't tell. Show don't tell is a, one of the most key things to all of writing. Right. They have told us that Garth is the greatest Starfleet captain, the most brilliant guy in the world. He doesn't do anything smart whatsoever in the whole episode. And what I go to, you know, I've said this thing before of, you know, great Star Trek episodes have interesting scientific ideas, a sense of adventure, and something personal. Well, if I'm going to list some of the stuff that happens in this episode, you tell me which one feels personal and which one feels the most interesting. Shapeshifter, crazy people on a planet trying to escape, and Kirk meets his hero. Kirk meets his hero. That's the most interesting thing in this episode. For sure. And mm -hmm. if you think about, oh, Kirk, the greatest captain of our era, is going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most brilliant captain of the previous era that he idolized, and it's going to be a battle of the wits, I would go, wow, that sounds like a... And a guy who's gone insane, I would go, wow, that sounds really great. Yep, absolutely. None of that's in this episode, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's, again, it's, there are... So many episodes that I watch over and over again. There are so many episodes that I watch from time to time. And there are, there are episodes that I, ha I don't watch at all and haven't seen in years. And probably would not have watched again if it wasn't for us doing a weekly podcast on the original series. This is the latter. And this is an episode I would not have watched if it wasn't for this podcast. Yeah. And re-watching it, you know, like sometimes I think, well, maybe I'll have different feelings about it. Like Miri is definitely the best example of an episode that I had a complete flip over because of our conversation or because there were elements of that episode that I found to be very good or timely because of what happened with 
especially after the pandemic and all that. But this episode, just I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to find something that is going to make it relevant, uh, a, 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 an epiphany that I'm going to have that makes, you know what, this episode is actually really good. Like our conversation on Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, like I always liked the episode, I know you did too, but I, I like it a whole lot more after right. our conversation. This one, I'm like, what could we possibly have to talk about with this episode that's going to elevate it? The answer is, I, I, I will just say, good luck, sir. <laughs> I wish you well on that, on that goal. Uh-huh. Um, well, and here's like the first one is that, okay, he has the power to shapeshift. So he greets them as the governor. And, then, and you would think that that's a really good power to manipulate someone to get them to do the thing, a thing that you want them to do. But then he just walks into the prison and then just shows them, no, I'm not the governor. Like, well, what was the point? Like, a brilliant guy would have used that shapeshifting ability to get something out of Kirk. You know, but he doesn't. He right. just, there was literally no point for he could have been just standing there with a phaser when Kirk and Spock beam down and it would have been the same. Or or he could have he could have stayed as Corey for much, much, much longer. longer. Uh you know, it just it just occurred to me like maybe he could have waited to see Captain Kirk try to beam up to the Enterprise, in which he would have learned Exactly. Right. But I don't I don't think that he could have been Corey and been sick and, and they go, oh, we have to immediately transport him to sick bay. Right. And now it's like man trap. You have a person on the Enterprise who can change shape into anything he wants. Who's the most brilliant captain in the yeah. world. That yeah. sounds like a good episode. That does sound like you a know. good episode. Sure. I am Lord God, formerly of Isar, and I lead the future masters of the universe. And I'm like, does he man know that you're going to leave this guy? <laughs> say, yeah. Um, and Marta is just all over him. And again, I just go like, act crazy. That was the direction she's given. Um, and I do like the way, and I'm assuming Matt Jeffrey set it up somehow, the way that Governor Corey is kind of floating in the cell. Yeah. I, it, I wonder, I, I was looking at it, like looking for strings. And I'm like, how did they do that? I couldn't, I couldn't find anything on how they were actually able to make it look like he was suspended like that. So Kirk, we talked about Kirk's ability to observe and to adapt and come up with a new plan. So he immediately changes his tactic and bows formally and says, I'm sorry, Lord God. So it's like, oh, his goal is going to be to play along. But then in the next moment, he strongly says, release him. And now he is attacking. And it's like, well, then you're not playing along. Then what was the point of the bow? Are you so afraid of him that you must keep him pinned? And you see Garth think for a moment, and he releases Corey. Yeah. That made me think of bread and circuses. Yeah. Like when Kirk says, I want to see Americus. The first citizen? Why would he bother with arena bait like you? Tell him it's Jim Kirk. Perhaps a friend. Perhaps? Well, if I am a friend, and you don't tell him, do you really want to risk that? Like he like turns it back over sure. to him, and Kirk is really good at that. Yeah, he's done the uh, are you afraid thing to other people, too. And I can't remember which ones they are, but I'm sure someone listening will tell us. <laughs> My crew mutiny. The first use I will make of the Enterprise is to hunt them down and punish them for that. The crew of the Enterprise will also mutiny. <laughs> Even someone as delusional as you must know that there's no way Kirk's crew is going to mutiny follow you down to hunt down the people who betrayed you. Well, even if Garth beams up as Kirk and is just pretending he's Kirk, they're still not going to do it. Absolutely. You well, know. look look what happens in Turnabout Intruder. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> the only time you're ever going to hear me use Turnabout Intruder as a, as a gold standard, <laughs> you know, for the crew. But they won't. You see, Captain, there's a helpful technique I've mastered. And he laughs again, and then he's Kirk. <laughs> And he heads off uh, with Marta. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. I'll miss you. <laughs> How do you think Shatner was during this episode? Like being able to play somebody different like that? I think that's the only thing in the episode that Shatner enjoyed. I agree. I agree. I mean, it's hard to say because like they're watching terrible, stupid things happen. But and so Kirk and Spock look bored and disinterested. But honestly, Shatner and Nimoy kind of look bored and disinterested mm-hmm. through parts of this episode. Uh, there is no help for any of us if that madman is in command of the Enterprise. He boasts that he's created the most powerful explosive in the universe. And I believe him. <laughs> what? Mm. So the guy who was in prison... <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's able to, he's able to make the most powerful explosive in the universe. First of all, 
how, how did you let him do that? Yeah. <laughs> did he, and it, or did he just do that after he got out and put you in jail and then he made it? I mean, it's just it's just dumb. I mean, it's like you could have done this episode without that. It's extremely it's contrived. Total, it, it's it's contrived and useless. Yep, I agree. Um, sometimes you have to do something that's contrived. To let, like so, in let our last episode, and let that be their last battlefield. We both said whatever the superpowers are, are totally contrived. Mm -hmm. and they don't make any sense, and they're kind of weird, and, and, and wonky is a plot point, but they allow us to have the countdown scene with the Enterprise being destroyed. Exactly. You know, like, that's a great scene. It's a great scene. So you use the contrived thing to get you to a great scene. Here it goes nowhere. It, right. ha it has no point at all. Yep, I agree. And then we hear some backstory that he was really wounded, and this people on this planet... In order, who had mastered cellular metamorphosis, used it to repair his body, and then they taught him the technique. Uh, by himself, he later learned to use the technique to recreate himself into any form he wished. And that's how, of course, he escaped, by pretending to be Corey, and then a guard came in, and that was that. Now Garth is in the control room, and he calls up to the Enterprise. Beam me aboard. Aye, sir. Queen to Queen's level three. And Kirk is getting irritated, or mm. or Garth rather is getting irritated. I said, "Beam me aboard." I said, "Queen to Queen's level three. We have no time for chess problems. Beam me aboard." I'm following your orders, Captain. Queen to Queen's level three. And then Garth says, "Just testing." Yeah, I'll call you later. <laughs> so first of all, why did Kirk do this? Set up this chess problem. He's never done it before. Right. That is another contrivance. Yeah. Um, there was no reason to think there was any threat going down to this planet. Mm -hmm. um, like, why Why would there be a threat that would have Kirk... You know what, Scotty? Just in case there's any problems, yeah. let's set up this thing. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to your hail, Queen to Queen's level three, with something else. I mean, it's kind of like the transponder in Patterns of Force. Here's a thing that is useful, that actually would have been useful. This would have been in great so many other episodes. circuses in all sorts of episodes. Yeah. This would be useful. But, uh, you know, it's only used in this one. And then Kirk slash Garth throws a full tantrum. No! No! Uh, and this is when people point to Shatner's overacting. Now, granted, the, he's not Kirk at this moment. He's Garth. And Garth is throwing a fit. And I think that Shatner had fun doing this. Maybe. I didn't have fun watching it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, it's just, and again, it's the, th it's the thing you said at the very beginning. Does this make him more threatening or less threatening? Less. Less. Yeah. It's, and, and this is like a basic rule is always make your bad guy more threatening. And, and what I would compare this to is in Space Seed, we have a brilliant bad guy who is, you know, we say this person is superior in every way, and he is fascinating throughout. And throughout, you're watching him going, oh, what is he thinking? What is he doing? You can see him planning and scheming and all this stuff he's doing to manipulate the situation. That's what this should have been. Yep. The most charismatic, interesting guy doing brilliant things. I agree completely. I gave him a sign. Why didn't he give me the counter sign? Something was wrong. So all the scenes with Scotty and McCoy on the bridge of the Enterprise, were filmed on day one. That's what I figured. I was going to guess that. Yes. they And, and in fact, so... Probably, day, probably in two hours. Day one was only a half day. Right. Because that's... that's the day birthday. I was born. Yeah. So so you actually had two episodes filmed on your birthday mm -hmm. because in the morning, uh, filming on Let That Be Your Last Battlefield ran over. So they had to finish filming it on the first half of this day. So when they finally wrapped on Let That Be Your Last Battlefield and started filming Whom Gods Destroy instead of bringing in uh, Herb Wallerstein to start directing the Brit scenes with Scotty and McCoy. Judd Taylor was who was already there because he just wrapped the prior episode. So Judd Taylor filmed all the Brit stuff with Scotty and McCoy. And then on day two, that's when Herb Wallerstein gotcha. came on to direct the rest of the episode. I mean, this is like for for doing in uh, DeForest Kelly. This is like in their sleep they could do these scenes, especially you McCoy, know. because like I'm I'm trying to think like if there was a moment where there was real jeopardy, like when you know the Enterprise was trying to get to Triskelion, you know, and Spock mm -hmm. was on a wild goose chase. I could see McCoy being on the bridge to kind of 
gives Spock a hard time. Or in the Tholian web, when he's like, you know, why did you fight them? But what is McCoy doing on the on the bridge right now? There's no threat yet, like at least not well, that we know of. It is, yeah. I mean, it it's weird that he doesn't do the response, but McCoy, I mean, he's just hanging out and talking, I guess. He's just like, yeah, he's just kind of hanging out with Scotty. They're just shooting this shit. Shooting <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally, my brain went, yeah, they're just shooting shit. And then I went, well, then I'd have to beep that out. And is it really worth it? And then as soon as I hear it, it's like, oh, Scott's going to say it. <laughs> um, well, and, and the thing, too, is all scenes should have conflict. And that's something that Star Trek did in the good episodes really, really well. Absolutely. Is yep. that if you're going to have McCoy there, have him disagree with Scotty. Right. Don't have him just agree. Like, mm-hmm. people should, dis- there should, like... Scotty could say, like, we need to do this. He's like, if you do that, you're going to might kill the captain. You know, like. Well, like in, in uh, Taste of Armageddon. Exactly. You know, McCoy was challenging Scotty. Yeah. We are going to take the Enterprise. We are going to take her. I have to shatter every bone in Captain Kirk's body. And that brings us to the end, thankfully, of Act One. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you haven't been too uncomfortable, Captain. I thank you for your concern. All in all, it's been rather restful. (laughs) Which I do like. Still, I'm afraid I've been quite remiss in my duties as your host. But I did invite you down to dinner, as you may recall. Uh, We head off to have some dinner. I hate this scene. It's terrible. It's terrible. I hate this scene. It's, there's, this feels like there's no purpose to it. It's, It's filler to an episode that, even without the filler, is still inconsequential. Well, let me ask you this. What, because I totally agree. Mm-hmm. What should the purpose be? Why has Garth invited Kirk to dinner? That's a great question. Well, I will tell you what, what it should be. Okay, tell which me. Which is, what is again, this is like the most basic writing slash acting storytelling thing. What does Garth want? Garth wants the response to Queen to Queen's level three. Right. That's what he wants. So why would he invite him to dinner? Because he wants to get Kirk on his side. That's so step one. Step two is going to be torture. Step one is persuasion, but he doesn't really do that. Right. There's no sense of a, like, um, there's so many characters, charismatic characters who end up being bad guys or flawed people, whether it's what are little girls made of doctor or Corby Corby or Khan or all these people or, um, uh, Daystrom, you know, who who end up being bad guys, but they have a goal and they're persuasive on some level. Right. They they actually believe that what they are doing is the right thing. Exactly. Right. So if Garth believed that, he could try to persuade Kirk of something. Mm-hmm. But he does, and 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 he could empathize with him. We're both ca- we're both captains. We know what it is to command. Right. I, but what is what is the purpose here? What is the purpose of this dinner scene? Like what? Is Garth trying to no, appeal yeah. to Kirk? Like, what does he want? He wants to steal the Enterprise. Even even in his right mind, Kirk knows there's no way that's going to happen. And the choice to make Marta could be a brilliant, a brilliant and dangerous accomplice. But what she is is just someone who acts crazy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. And that's what we have in a lot of the scene is she's kind of flirting with Kirk, and he gets mad at her and insults her and calls her names and. Then she starts talking about how she's beautiful, intelligent, and she writes poetry, and then she quotes one of her one of her quote unquote poems. Shakespeare. I, I do like that when Garth tells her that this Earth man named Shakespeare wrote that a long time ago. Which does not alter the fact that I wrote it again yesterday. <laughs> it's like why why is this important? Like what wh- what does this have to do with the getting the answer to that one question. Right, right. Because he doesn't bring it up until later. And then as they're bickering, Spock says to Kirk, Captain, if you could create a diversion, I might be able to find the control room and open the force field. You know what's wrong with that sentence, that line? What's wrong with that? Should be Kirk. What, is Spock the captain now? No, Kirk is the guy who says create a diversion and I will go to the control room. Right, right. Since when is Spock the more, per- that's not who these characters are supposed to be. Well, at this point, yeah. I think it's like, it feels... A, a lot of just the overall feeling is like they're on their way out. Yeah. Uh, and they continue to bicker. But the one thing that does come up is that she d- is a dancer and Garth goes, yeah, well, she is a good dancer. And then she dances for them. She dances. And by the way, the 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 entire dining room sequence was filmed on day six, including Marta's dance. So you hear this music while Marta is dancing. Yeah. And I was thinking like, you know what? That really would have been cool if they used the music from Vina's dance. So I had the I had the same thought. On Rigel set or you know in the cage. Yeah. Yeah. But then the sp- dance is the dance is done. Yeah, it's done. And it, it goes on a really long time. And again, I don't know like 
in the cage, I know why Pike is watching that dance mm-hmm. because it's a fantasy of his. And the dramatic question is, will he give into the fantasy or will he not? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what that is. Why are we having this here? Because it's filler. It's filler. Yeah. It's filler and that's yeah. all it is. And by the way, Spock, again, this is where I go, is Spock bored or is Nimoy bored? <laughs> you know? Well, I'm going to say that Nimoy is bored because it comes to a head later and we'll get to re- mm. we'll get to why very soon. As for Yvonne Craig on the green makeup, the makeup looked different than it did with Susan Oliver yeah. and Vina in the cage. So there was a reason for that. And Yvonne Craig said they couldn't remember how they got Susan Oliver green in the cage. They somehow lost the makeup, so they had to devise a substitute formula. As a result, I had skid marks because the makeup wouldn't stay on. They sprayed me with liquid bandage, which had to be removed with acetone, Ugh. so my skin was burned. I was a walking disaster. It, do- it doesn't look nearly as good. It doesn't. I it's agree. Just, it looks like someone in green makeup, whereas the Vena makeup looks pretty it cool. It looks pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Fred Phillips did a great job yeah. with that. And there's this weird bit where Spock describes the dance as nostalgic and reminds him of kids and Vulcan dancing, and I don't get it. <laughs> that dance, by the way, is two minutes long. Is it really? Two minutes, yeah. Two minutes. Two minutes too long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and now, where Garth had been angry at Marta for flirting with Kirk, now he offers her to Kirk. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, she's yours if you wish, Captain. Like, oh, uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> this is this very magnanimous of you. Well, you'll find that I am magnanimous to my friends and merciless to my enemies. And I want you, both of you, to be my friends. So finally, we've gotten to, like, I'm kind of trying to persuade you. But he doesn't do much to persuade them. I have charted more new worlds than any man in history. And tried to destroy Andros IV. Why? So these are the people that saved him that now he wants to kill, right, exactly. to destroy. Mm-hmm. I studied your victory at Axanar when I was a cadet. In fact, it still required reading at the academy. So Axanar is mentioned in Court Martial mm. when the computer is is going through all of Kirk's achievements. Is that like the Medal Ta- of Axanar or yeah, something yeah, like that? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. That's where Axanar is first mentioned. And then there's this really weird thing that is said that I think they are trying to create some a, a piece of continuity or Federation history, but it doesn't really fit correctly. But my first visit to Axanar was as a new-fledged cadet on a peace mission. Peace mission? Politicians and weaklings! They were humanitarians and statesmen. And they had a dream. A dream that became a reality and spread throughout the stars. A dream that made Mr. Spock and me brothers. So is he saying this is the origin of the Federation? That's what it sounds like he's saying. Uh, I, I didn't get that, that it was the origin of the Federation. I mean, it can't be the origin of the Federation. No, it can't. No, that's why I say it doesn't make sense. But yeah. but how is their dream when they go to Axanar to make a peace treaty what spread throughout the stars and made him and Spock brothers? Uh, it just I mean, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't make it's sense. It's not worth spending a lot right. of time on it. What I do like... Yeah, me too. What I do like is that Kirk refers to Spock as his brother. And Spock says, Captain Kirk speaks somewhat figuratively and with undue emotion. However, what he says is logical, and I do, in fact, agree with it. They're acknowledging that they are brothers, and I I took that more to be like, well, after all this time together, everything that they've been through, especially with moments, whether they're, you know, sitting on the edge of forever or a mock time, They have earned that brotherhood. It's a totally nice moment. It's the only nice moment for me, really, in the whole Mm -hmm. episode. It doesn't emotionally resonate the way that I wish it should because it's surrounded by a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. I agree. I agree. Uh, Yet, Mr. Spock, you are a worthy commander in your own right. And in my fleet, you will surely have a starship to command. And the whole Spock's response, where, where, where's your fleet? Where are you going to get your fleet? It's out there. <laughs> and then Spock, in this unbelievably condescending way. Captain Garth. Lord Garth. As you wish. <laughs> At any rate, you must be aware of the fact that you are attempting to recreate the disaster which resulted in you becoming an inmate in this place. Again, I go... Everything that Spock says is true Mm -hmm. and logical, and so that sounds like a thing a Vulcan would say. What's Spock's plan? Why is he insulting Garth at this moment? He knows the guy's nuts and is going to just do exactly what he does. 
You were treated with justice and with compassion, which you failed to show towards any of your intended victims. Logically, therefore, one must assume... We leave this animal! See, that's what I mean. Like, he's so over the top, I just can't take him seriously. Yeah, well, and again, what are you trying to do? Then, out of nowhere, he says... By the way, I assume you play chess. Occasionally. So do I. How would you respond to Queen to Queen's level three? He's done nothing to get Kirk to say yes to this. Right, right. He's he's done nothing to to get Kirk to trust him. Yeah, nothing. Right. I'm sure you're aware that there are an infinite number of counter moves. I'm interested in only one. I can't for the life of me imagine which one. For the life of me is a phrase well chosen, Captain. It could literally come to that. So that it means that we're now at threats, which means the whole dinner scene was useless. Mm-hmm. You know, right. there was no moment where he was really persuasive. with, Kirk. And there was nothing about the dinner sequence that advances the story forward. Nope. And then he, they bring out the dagger of the mind chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly very, like, it looks slightly different. Yeah, it's a different. little different. Yeah. It's a little different. But, well, like in the dagger of the mind chair, the light was from above. Yeah. You know, now it's on like the, on sides. the sides. Yeah. Yes, I recognize it. It's used for rehabilitation purposes. So they're obviously acknowledging the connection to Dagger of the Mind, right? Yes. So again, this is a point where you could have made something personal because what was Kirk's experience in that chair? Uh, really messed him up. Really messed him up. Yeah, he says so, at the end, not when you sat in that chair. So he could be having a reaction to the chair. I mean, if we're if we're pointing out that this is from Dagger of the Mind, which they're kind of doing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he could be having a more personal reaction. I've added certain refinements to the use of ultrasonic waves. The chair is no longer painless. And we grab out Governor Corey and stick Governor Corey in. Queen to Queen's level three, Captain Kirk. Kirk doesn't answer. It is, in fact, exquisitely painful, as you will now see. And now we start torturing Corey. By the way, it was at this point, the, the long shot, the full body shot of Garth, where I realized he's wearing his boots don't match. Oh, really? I one, didn't notice one that. One boot is blue, the other blue, the other boot is green. <laughs> By the way, they let they let him get some pretty funky costumes in this insane asylum. Like, <laughs> it's pretty nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask Kirk for the code again. Doesn't get it. Too bad. Remove our distinguished governor with Captain Kirk in the chair. And Marta is trying to now defend Kirk. I don't quite know why. And they turn the pain thing on. And once again, Kirk gets to do some pain acting. <laughs> and uh, he asks for the countersign again. Doesn't give it. And that is the end of that, too. Act three, we're back in the same spot. Please stop it. You want him, don't you? Yes. And she basically says, I can get him to tell what you want. And he goes, oh, that could be interesting. And they turn the machine off. Back on the bridge, we're still trying to figure out what to do. And basically, it's a useless scene. I, I, I honestly, you know, cutting back to the Enterprise, usually, you know, you're, you're trying to see them, like, like, figure out, like, okay, what are we going to do? Yeah. But we get back to the Enterprise, and we're told, There's nothing we can do. You're right. It's a worthless cut back to the Enterprise. And you said this from Battlefield is the script is short. Yeah. And so we're padding it out. Kirk is in bed. Marta is pouring him some wine and we're back in. This is a a Star Trek trope of the, you know, the seduction scene. There's this moment where she says, I would have told him anything to save you from that torment. I believe you mean that. Does he believe that she means that? No, I don't think so. He's just playing into her okay. at this point. Because um, he would be a fool to believe anything she says. I'll help you, but you must wait. You do see that, don't you? Soon your friend Spock will be here, and then... Spock? At least I've arranged that much. Do you trust this the first time you saw this? Not one bit. Do you think Kirk trusts this the f- at all? Uh, he shouldn't. I don't think he does. I, I, I mean, I think he, I think he believes that's, that, that Spock was freed even though it's not really him. I think Kirk is not very smart in this episode. I agree. You know, you got a shapeshifter around. You shouldn't be trusting anything. That's true. And then she kisses him and reaches under the pillow and grabs a knife and tries to kill him. All right. So this is day eight uh, of filming, and that includes the first day, which was actually a half day. Right. All right. So when Marta grabs the knife and Kirk tries to wrestle the knife out of her hand, you see him do like this like chop to her hand and there, there's a very quick edit to the next moment where the knife is mm-hmm. across the room. So what happened was 
when Kirk tried to knock the knife out of Marta's hand, Shatner cut his hand on the prop knife. Ooh. So Yvonne Craig said, in the struggle, he was, accidentally st- he was accidentally stabbed in the fleshy part of his palm. Such drama. I thought it was a minor injury, but we shut down shooting while minions rushed to give him a soothing shot of whiskey to calm his nerves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne Craig has very vivid memories of filming this episode. I just like the... <laughs> Give me a shot of whiskey, stat. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so they, so as you say, the knife gets knocked away, and there is Mister Spock, and she. I do like her line. You mustn't stop me. He's my lover, and I have to kill him. Because she's crazy. And then we get a famous Spock neck pinch. Now here's my question: Does Garth know the Vulcan pinch? Did Marta fake passing out? See, I I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing because. Garth is able to transform into another life form. Is he able to replicate the the effect of the Vulcan neck pinch? Right. So my my feeling after rewatching this, because I did ask myself that question, did Garth really master that or did he tell Marta to fake it? I think he told Marta to fake it. I don't think that Garth knows how to do the neck pinch. I I, I think it is um, a bit of weak writing because I, I agree. It, and I think they needed to make a choice, mm. which they kind of didn't. Uh, here, here, I'll give you an, a good example of this kind of choice, and it's off the topic, but it's an interesting one, is that really good films follow the rules that they create mostly. And like one of the rules from the movie Jaws is that you only hear the shark theme when the shark is there is that the movie never tries to trick you that the shark is there when it's not there. So when the little kids have the cardboard fin, there's there's no shark music because they're not cheating. Um, This is kind of cheating. You know what I mean? Because they just, because their point is they want to convince us that that's Spock. And so they have him do Spock-like things rather than thinking, well, what does Garth know and how does he know it and what is he doing? Right. You know? Yeah. Um, Anyway. Seems to have worked out an infallible method for assuring permanent male fidelity. Interesting. I'm very glad to see you. Thank you, Captain. We're now armed. I presume we shall try to reach the control room. Yes, you presume correctly. Now, Smart Kirk would have gone, switch phasers with me. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know? Right, right. Smart Kirk should not be trusting this. Right. Smart Kirk should know that we have a guy here who can transform into somebody completely different well and crazy lady who just tried to stab me right. freed spock like why what what well, where is spock why did you bring spock with you yeah right like so so she freed spock but left him there so she could come try to seduce him and spock has been sitting around yeah like kirk kirk should be figuring this out uh we enter the control room we call up to scotty captain i suggest you return to the ship at once your safety is vital to the enterprise and this was my objection when it was actually Spock, and now it's Garth. He tells the captain what to do? I also request permission to remain here in charge of the security team is being down. Very well. It's just so out of character yep. for mm-hmm. Spock mm-hmm. to say this. And then he, he doesn't wait for Kirk to respond. He just talks to Scotty. Mr. Scott, the captain's life is in immediate danger. Beam him aboard at once. The security team will be entrusted to me. So he just totally told ignored Kirk, gave orders on his own. At this point, if Kirk didn't know it was Garth before, he should know it now. But this is what tips him off. I don't think so, because it's it's the queen-to-queen moment, and then there's the look. Scotty, Mr. Spock will give the countersign. And they step away from each other, and Spock says, Give him the countersign, Captain. Security detail. And then he turns the force field back on and turns back to Garth. Yep. Blast away, Captain. Can. You think I'm fool enough to give you a charged phaser? Now, when I saw this for the first time, for the very first time, I thought that that was really Spock. Oh. Yeah. But the first time when right. I was a kid, I so thought it, it was Spock. You. Yeah, it, it did fool me. It did. When, when I was a kid, it, it definitely did fool me. You know, it just occurred to me that the not giving someone a charged phaser, I just suddenly went, oh, it's like John McClane and Hans in Die Hard, where he hands him the gun after sl- sliding oh, the yeah. clip Oops. out. Oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No bullets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you done with Spock? Where is he? I have done nothing with him as of yet. I do have plans for him. The Vulcan will die rather horribly, and his death will be on your conscience. 
And he says, Captain Garth. Lord Garth! <laughs> Garth, Lord Garth! <laughs> and now Kirk has a strategy, which he's yeah. going to try to bring him back to remembering what was great about being Captain Garth. He's going to really try to reason, get, get through yeah. to the person that Garth was. He's down there somewhere. Yeah. And he, he does, first of all, by playing to his ego, he says, You were the finest student at the Academy. The finest Starship captain, you were the prototype, the model for the rest of us. Yes, I do remember that. It was a great responsibility. It's like, oh, Kirk is making some progress. But the, the progress doesn't go very far. No, no, yeah. I want you to find what you once had. I want you to go back to the greatness that you've lost, Captain Ryan. I am Lord Goth! I am Lord Goth! <laughs> I am Lord Goth! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's so> sad. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're watching you're watching the episode it's supposed to be a really suspenseful moment and then he goes i am lord god and you you start laughing it's like ridiculous <laughs> you doubt me only because i have not as of yet had my coronation oh sir listen to me I stop <laughs> so now we had the dinner scene which is a totally wasted scene <laughs> and now we're going to head towards the coronation scene all the others before me have failed Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, Lee Kuan, Crotus. <laughs> Crotus. <laughs> By the way, at least there's consistency yeah. because you did hear Spock mention Lee Kuan at the end yeah. of Patterns of Force. So, but Garth, Garth, Lord Garth, went yeah. a step closer and brought in who, who the hell is Crotus? Maybe he's a Klingon. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, has, I mean, there must be stories in all the Star Trek lore of Lee Kwan and what all that was. Yeah. I'm sure there. I'm, I'm sure, sure there's there's a there's, there's a, a TV series about a book he made and, on yeah. Paramount Plus about yeah. Lee Kwan. <laughs> and and Kirk is like kind of backing up in sort of an abject bowing stance, basically trying to get over to the control panel. And Kirk tries to hit the control and. Garth shoots him. And that's the end of Act 3. We're finally in Act 4, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, and now we're going to do this coronation scene, and they're going to set up a table and bring in a crown. and Another scene that really doesn't what? go anywhere. Like, why is this here? Yeah, what is its point? It's so, it's filler. And he offers Kirk to be the crown prince, the heir apparent. Marta is his consort, whatever yeah. that means. And there's talk of, you know, human sacrifice, and I don't even know what all this is about. Since there is no one mighty enough to perform this ceremony, we'll perform it ourselves. Therefore, we hereby proclaim that I am Lord Garth, master of the universe. So I'm glad we got that taken care of. <laughs> he gives Marta a necklace, which is going to come back later. He ma officially makes Kirk his heir apparent. There's claps. He mounts the throne. They clap. He sits. They clap. <laughs> My note at this point is, Jesus Christ, this is terrible. Yes. Yes, it, it is. It's just, there's, it's all pointless. The whole coronation scene is like completely useless. Let's now remove our heir apparent that we may conclude this ceremony. So they drag Kirk away to the control room. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Why did, why did they put him in the control room? And Kirk is like talking to them, trying to distract them, saying it's their last chance, while he's over at the control panel trying to turn down the force field. And they're they're just letting him. They're do just it. letting him. Like, wh why did they bring him here? Why are they letting him do this? Um, and finally, they do hit him and knock him down. And Garth comes in. I've arranged a small entertainment. I want not to miss any of it. So they pull up a chair for Kirk. They put him in the chair. Well, Captain, even you must admit that I'm a genius. And again, I go to. Show that the guy's a genius. Have him do smart things. Don't mm -hmm. just keep saying he's a genius. And now he pulls out his latest invention, which is a vial of the most ex powerful ex explosive ever in history. That he just happened to create while on this penal colony. And now he's talking about how volatile it is and one drop and one could destroy the whole planet. And then he's tossing it and catching it. And he almost drops it, by the way. He does not quite. You know, it's like. So what you're saying is what you think crazy means is being stupid. That's what they think crazy is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you require the demonstration of a ring. 
opens up a screen, and there we see Marta being dragged out into the poisonous clouds. And they're being dragged out by two of the aliens that are wearing the spacesuits that the were used from the Tholian web. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. You got your that, wish. But that's better money saving. I'm, <laughs> I'm much okay with that. But I thought the scene when I was growing up was really disturbing. I... I I agree. I, I, I agree. I think I think it is disturbing. Because I got to tell you, like when, so you see that Marta is suffocating and she, you can see her mouthing, Garth, please. And it's so sadistic when you see the explosion actually happen. You know, it doesn't cut away and then cut back to the explosion. You see Yvonne Craig begging, you yeah. know, on her hands and knees, you know, through outside in the atmosphere. And then there's this big explosion. Like, that's not CGI. <laughs> no, they actually killed Yvonne Craig. They actually crazy. blew her up. <laughs> what, what, so, first of all, why have the explosive? The planet is covered in poison gas. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to kill her, you didn't need to introduce this whole dumb explosive thing at all. But, there, you know, but you see the explosion, and then you cut back to the Enterprise, and McCoy makes the comment, must have wiped out everything. I'm like, no, it didn't. It's it just a, a little explosion. explosion. <laughs> well, and the, and the other thing, too, is why did he put Marta out in the gas and why did he blow her up? Because he was trying to show Kirk that he meant business. Why not ask Kirk Queen to Queen's level three and I'll save her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just blowing her up. He didn't get anything out of that. Right. Right. But do you, but do you think that Kirk would have saved her? It would have given Kirk an opportunity to try to do something cool. You know, mm. like maybe Kirk lies about what the, the call sign is and gives him a different chess move that mm. gives and they bring Marta in. And right. Him, and you know, buys him some time. Buys him some time. You, right. you know, I, in um, uh, the Kira Kurosawa film Hidden Fortress, one of the things they did was there were basically two writing teams, Kurosawa and his partner and this other writer and their partner. And they would write, they would basically go up into the mountains in a cabin and they would drink tons and tons of sake and they would all write together. And here's how they wrote Hidden Fortress, which by the way, is one of the main inspirations for Star Wars, for Star Wars is that what they did was gr group one would put the characters in a horrible situation. Mm -hmm. And then they would hand that script to group two who had to figure out how to get them out of the horrible situation. Oh, I see. I see. And then they would get the characters to another horrible situation and hand it back. So they continually challenge each other. Okay, get out of this. And if you think about Star Wars, like that's the trash compactor in Star Wars. Right. Throw our characters in a horrible situation and now try to figure out how we're gonna get them out. You know, um, throwing your characters in a terrible situation is always a good idea. But Kirk's not in a terrible situation because he has no opportunity to save Marta. Right, right. Um, and yes, there's more talk on the bridge about what just happened that, again, goes nowhere. I mean, they say we're going to fire a narrow beam or something to cut into yeah, the force Yeah, they fire two phaser blasts to punch a hole in the far side of the force field so it won't affect right. you know, Kirk and Spock and everyone else. But then they say, oh, nope, force field's still holding, which makes me go, well, that was all useless. You're an extraordinary fellow, Kirk. Your stubbornness defies all logic. There's the key. Your friend Spock is a logical man. Go and bring the Vulcan here to me. So we cut to Spock in the cell. And he's like testing out the force field on the cell. Mm -hmm. Which I, I'm sure is Nimoy's idea and is one of the few interesting things he gets to do in the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the guards come. And the camera is zooming in on Spock as the guards are approaching. And when they get there, he's on the ground. They lift him up. They have his arms over their shoulders. They're dragging him away. And we get a double. A double FSNP, FSNP which is the only time that happened in the original series. Now he's got both phasers. And we see Spock coming on the monitor. Your Vulcan friend is a very ingenious fellow. This could be most amusing. And Spock comes into the control room and we get two Kirks. Yeah, two Kirks. So this was actually filmed on the second day of production on this episode. The filming, though, of the Kirk versus fight scene was delayed because Leonard Nimoy had issues with the way the scene was written. He wrote what was dubbed as the letter, the letter to Gene Roddenberry mm. and Douglas Kramer. Douglas Kramer was the head of production for Paramount, and he copied Fred Freiberger, who was the current producer, and John Reynolds, the president of Paramount Television. The letter said, and this is from Nimoy, not only is Spock unable to cleverly, dramatically, 
and fascinatingly arrive at a solution. But he also proves to be a lousy gun hand since he allows the two men to become embroiled in a brawl while he stands there holding a phaser, not sure whether he should shoot one or both or maybe just let them fight it out and hope the best man wins. So Nimoy was by this point really irritated with the lapses in in judgment and logic when it came to the writing of the character. And by this point in the third season, Nimoy, just like Shatner, they were very, very protective of their characters and knew their characters better than the new people who were writing and producing Star Trek. So Nimoy writes this letter and Freiberger was really upset that he sent it to Douglas Kramer and copied John Reynolds. Hmm. And like he was really bitter about it for many, many years. But Nimoy is like- it felt like an end run. Yeah. If he's yeah. like, I, I don't- that I'm not going to play the scene. So so they said, play the scene. They're like, play the scene. So what Nimoy did was he said, you know what? I really don't know how to play the scene. Like he said, I, I you know, contractually, you can get me to, to film this. And when it came to the filming of this, he took his sweet time getting ready for it. Like, he really held everybody up. That's why the episode went a day over schedule. Wow. But when it came to the actual filming of the scene, his defense was in order to stay within his contractual obligation to film the scene. But he just said, I don't know how to do this. So finally, Freiberger convinced him to do it. And he said, just like, basically, like, trust me, you'll see it'll all work out. But Nimoy was really kicking and screaming. And they, going didn't, into they didn't make any changes to the scene. No. See, no, they didn't. Because, like, why doesn't Spock shoot them both? Just shoot them both. Instead of asking stupid questions, it just would have made more sense for Spock to shoot them both because, obviously, Garth is not going to be able to stay as Kirk after he's stunned. He would have turned back into Garth. And then you have the other Kirk, who's clearly the one. Well, even if he doesn't, you stun them both. You beam down the security team. You put them both in handcuffs. And then you deal with it later. You know what I mean? Like, shoot them both. It's, it's so obvious. Yeah, absolutely. And there were ways you could have done it that would be cool. Um, but they each are trying to convince him that they're the real Kirk, which also doesn't seem that hard. Yeah. Because they've been through a lot of stuff together. Queen to Queen's level three. I won't answer that. That's exactly what he wants to know. Very clever. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. And Spock goes over to the panel. What maneuver did we use to defeat the Romulan vessel near Tau Ceti? Very good, Spock. The Cochrane deceleration. Cochrane deceleration. So is that a reference to Zephyr Cochrane from Metamorphosis? I, so, yeah. I assume so, too. Yeah. Yeah. But w it would have been much cooler to ask him a question from actual yeah, series. Absolutely. Uh huh. Right. Because all right. he had to say is, who is Edith Keeler? And we would have known who's the right Kirk. Absolutely. You know, the Cochrane deceleration is a classic battle maneuver. Every starship captain knows that. That didn't work. Whichever one of you is Captain Garth must at this moment be expending a great deal of energy to maintain the image of Captain Kirk. I don't think there's any way for Spock to know that. That energy level cannot be maintained indefinitely, and I have time. So he grabs a chair, and he goes to sit down. And he looks away for a moment yeah. to make sure he's sitting down on the chair, which is such a such a clumsy clumsy direction, the directing of the scene was really clumsy. Well, Andy looks away for a moment to give the other guy an opportunity to hit him. Right. You know, and it's like, look, if there... If there are two guys, one on my left and one on my right, I know which one hit me. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that mysterious when I look up and they both look the same. You know, that that does it. But anyway, now we get a Kirk versus Kirk fight. And I will tell you something. I didn't quite put my finger on it at the time. When we did Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and I've always said I love that movie up until the end. Yeah. It's the two Kirk scene that I hate. And the reason I hate it is because I hate this episode is that it's referencing an episode that's terrible, that's of the cheesiest of cheesy moments in all of Star Trek. Yeah. Is yeah, what's I being referenced in Star Trek VI, which is a really good movie. I love Star Trek VI. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they fight. Pretty good use of doubles, I think. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't I didn't think I was watching a stunt, man. Like, yep. it actually looked pretty good. And we end up with one Kirk holding the chair up in the air and the other Kirk in front of him. I'm your captain, Spock. Can't you tell? Shoot! Shoot! He's right, Spock. You must shoot. But you must shoot both of us. It's the only way to ensure the safety of the Enterprise. Finally, Box shoots the other guy. By the way, I would have shot both of them. I would have shot both of them. Yeah, yeah just I in case. Shot, I would have 
you know, not stood there for five minutes, I would have shot them both right away. <laughs> because a really smart Garth, if we had had an intelligent Garth, would have said exactly that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he shoots uh, the Kirk with the chair, who morphs into Garth. He hits the panel, and they call up the Enterprise. Queen to Queen's level three. Queen to King's level one. And now it's later on. We're giving the magical medicine shot to the Andorian, and we see that Garth is in that chair, obviously now no longer a torture device. Captain Garth, I'm James Kirk. I'm Lord Garth. <laughs> <laughs> he does not say I'm Lord Garth. They shake hands, and Garth walks away, turns back and says in a very soft voice, Should I know you, sir? No. Captain. No. And he turns and he walks away. And then we have our final little supposed to be fun moment with Kirk and Spock where Kirk is going. What took you so long? I was waiting for a victor in the hand-to-hand -hand struggle, which I assumed would be Captain Garth. And Kirk goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because of your depleted condition, failing a resolution to the struggle, I was forced to use other means to make my determination. I see. Mr. Spock, um... Letting yourself be hit on the head, and I presume you let yourself be hit on the head, is not exactly a method King Solomon would have approved. And that is our kind of joke at the end. That's and then kind of our joke up. at the end. It made me long for the Kunisms. Yeah. Scott, <laughs> I know I have a strong opinion about this episode. What did the people who worked on it say? Well, Yvonne Craig has a lot to say about this oh, episode. Oh, goody. Uh, Yvonne Craig said, William Shatner not only moved me around physically for the betterment of his profile, but he suggested line readings so that he could respond in a way that he had predetermined. Ooh. I was astonished that the director had allowed this to go on. He allowed himself to be subordinate to the whims of the series' obvious quote-unquote star. So it oh. doesn't sound like she had a great experience. Uh, she had more to say about the makeup as well. She said, it was hideous. It was hideous. I would take two showers at the studio, then go home and take an oil bath, then take another shower to get the remainder of it off. Then I would start all over again the next day. I thought there isn't enough money in the world to make me go through that again. And then Walter Koenig, who isn't even in the episode, yeah. said, I thought Whom God's Destroy was pretty bad. Yeah. So, way to go, Walter. <laughs> um, I don't have a whole lot to say about this episode. I feel like I've already said it. Like, it's, it's, it's a weird thing as we're heading towards the end because I want to be able to be celebrating Star Trek. I've, this, this journey with you has been so great. The show has gotten so much better and more profound and more interesting. We've gone along. And in this episode, it's like, I don't, I don't think there's much here to talk about, you know? Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, I, I, I think this is the moment that we were kind of dreading Yeah, was that we would get towards the end of the third season and feel like we were doing one episode after another. That was, that was not very good. And that, that is the case. I mean, that which survives was not, Ter terribly good. Although, let that be your last battlefield was was a fantastic conversation yeah. for an episode that I know we both really love. Uh, and but unfortunately, the next episode is another one that is not going to be all that great. But uh, you know, doing this conversation with you for whom God's destroyed did not make me like it any more than I hoped I would. I still don't think it is a it is a good episode. It's not one that I plan to watch again anytime soon. You know what just occurred to me? Because most of the time when we've heard guest stars talk about their experience on the show, they usually say, you know, Bill Shatner was a ball. I had a great time. So much fun on the set. And that's not what we're hearing here. Right. And, right. And, and people usually say how, you know, professional and great Nimoy is. And he doesn't seem very engaged. And, and it occurs, and I remember the stories from Wrath of Khan where Nicholas Myers said that his technique for directing Shatner was to give him take after take after take where it got bigger and bigger and bigger and then he got tired and then you got the truth. Right, right. Is that it seems to me like Shatner is the kind of actor, and this isn't a criticism, I mean, it is kind of a criticism, but he needs strong help to get him to give the, he needs good scripts and he needs directors who don't let him do what it sounds like he was doing with Yvonne Craig well, in this what was happening? what was happening by the third season was when he, when Shatner knew that his script wasn't very good, that's when he overcompensated. Because if you go back to like Balance of Terror, he is so right on point, pitch perfect in that episode. Uh, he's like, there's almost a restraint there. 
because he knows the material is good. He doesn't have to play it too high because the material speaks for itself. He was perfect in that episode. But by the, by the end of the third season, when the quality was definitely suffering, and again, Finnerman was gone, Bob Justman was gone, Fontana, Gene Kuhn, Rod Berry, all those people were gone. You know, you had basically a producer who didn't really get what Star Trek was. You have screenwriters and directors. Yeah, the, the director at this point, they, it was Herb Wallerstein. He was a fireman. You know, he was someone who just came in and got the job done. And, you know, this is, this is, these are the kinds of directors that they had towards the end of the third season. Uh, you know, Lee Irwin, you know, like you had the blind leading the blind. You didn't have someone who really got the show and you had only the actors in their, you know, look, look how defensive Spock got, or rather Leonard right. Nimoy got, and, uh, and how like Chatter just like laid it on a little too thick. I mean, that's what happened by the end of the third season. Yeah. Like they were trying to save themselves. And at the same time, they were also, uh, the morale was really down because they, the ratings, well, it's not that the ratings were bad, but the, that they were not getting support from Paramount and they just knew that the end was near. Yep. So that is what we think for whom gods destroy. We'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe, maybe we miss some stuff. Maybe there's some really great moments that you really enjoy. And we'd love to hear you talk about them on our Facebook page, search for enterprise incidents or on Twitter, enter incidents or on enterprise incidents on Instagram. And of course, as always, please review the show on Apple podcasts. And while you're there, make sure to subscribe or you could subscribe on a bunch of other places, including YouTube. And if you want to support the show, because I'll tell you something, it's always a lot of work, but going through an episode like this, this is this was work, and uh, we could really use your support. Right in the show notes, you can. There's a link to Anchor where you can support the show for as little as ninety nine cents a month, as much as nine ninety nine a month, and we would appreciate any support you can give us. And if while you're at it, if you are just sort of finding us more recently and you haven't gone back to the beginning to listen to Enterprise Incidents, please do so so you can hear our deep dive conversations on the best of the best episodes like Balance of Terror, Sitting on the Edge of Forever, A Mock Time, Doomsday Machine, uh, Journey to Babel, Mirror, Mirror, my favorite metamorphosis. You know, we've had director Ralph Sinensky on the show for all six of the episodes that he has done. We had David Gerald on for Trouble with Tribbles. We had Walter Kenny going for Games of Triskelion. We were joined by uh, uh, Susan Howard, the first woman to play a Klingon on Day of the Dove. So many episodes to go back and listen to if you haven't already heard them, but please be sure to share Enterprise Incidents on your social media pages so other people who have not yet found us can find us because it is never too late to find Enterprise Incidents and go back to the beginning. And again, just like Steve said, please support us on Anchor. We really do appreciate the 50 of you who've been supporting us so far. And we are grateful to the 2,100 plus people who have subscribed and followed us on our Enterprise Incidents Facebook page. And be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And Steve, where can people follow you? SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And if you would like to see what I would say are more successful films about people who are kind of losing touch with reality, on my other podcast, The Cinephiles, we've done some incredible films like Fight Club, Taxi Driver, Vertigo, Network, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind with my good friend Scott Mance as our very special guest. That is a fascinating exploration of a guy who doesn't quite know what's going on. And and also, Steve, Steve, I'm assuming since we are covering an episode here about an asylum, I'm assuming that you did on the Cinephiles cover One Flew Over the Cuckoo's nope. Nest. Not yet. yet. I've not done it yet. Well, well that is definitely one, one for the books for you to do. And in the meantime, you'd be sure to follow us and, and join us for the next Voyage of Enterprise Incidents which will be another episode that I'm sure will be an interesting conversation, one that we might have to struggle to get through because it is the mark of Gideon. So please do join us regardless for what is sure to be a fun and engaging and very honest conversation about the mark of Gideon. That's next on Enterprise Incidents. And until then, keep going boldly. Boldly.